Hello, and thank you for joining us. I'm Gwen Taylor, Senior Developmental Editor with Current Protocols at John Wiley & Sons, and I'm delighted to introduce today's webinar titled Combining Data-Independent Analysis for Broad-Scale Phenotyping and Targeted Tandem Mass Spectrometry Quantification of Specific Biomarkers. This webinar is being co-sponsored by Current Protocols and Thermo Fisher Scientific. Thermo Fisher Scientific is the world leader in serving science. They help their customers accelerate life sciences research, solve complex analytical challenges, improve patient diagnostics, and increase laboratory productivity. Their four premier brands, Thermo Scientific, Life Technologies, Fisher Scientific, and Unity Lab Services, offer an unmatched combination of innovative technologies, purchasing convenience, and comprehensive support. Current Protocols has been in continuous publication for 28 years and is the largest collection of peer-reviewed, authoritative, and regularly updated step-by-step -step research techniques and procedures available for life scientists worldwide. With 17 titles and over 16,000 protocols, Current Protocols is part of Wiley Publishers. During today's program, we encourage you to submit your questions throughout the event by clicking on the Ask a Question box at the bottom of your screen. Your question will not be seen by any of the other attendees, so please don't be shy about asking them. The webinar will be recorded and available for viewing in the next few days. We will send you an email with details of how to access the recorded webinar, along with a PDF of the slides and a certificate of attendance. And now, it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Dr. John Kuhlman is an Associate Professor and the Scientific Director of Proteomics at the H. Lee Moffitt Cancer Center and Research Institute in Tampa, Florida. His research focuses on the use of quantitative proteomics to understand cancer biology with the goal of improving patient care. Dr. Kuhlman received his Ph.D. from Dr. David Russell at Texas A&M University in 2002 and proceeded to join Ryuji Kobayashi's laboratory at MD Anderson Cancer Center as a junior faculty member. In 2005, Dr. Kuhlman joined the faculty at Moffitt Cancer Center and has developed a proteomic shared resource in addition to his own research laboratory. So let's get started with a very warm welcome to you, Dr. Kuhlman. Thank you very much. I have, appreciate the opportunity to speak today, and what I want to talk about is the use of some of the cutting-edge uh, mass spectrometry equipment for integrating multiple scan types to evaluate questions in cancer biology. So the title of this talk, again, is Combining Data Independent Analysis for Broad-Scale Phenotyping with Specific Targeted Tandem Mass Spectrometry Quantification of Biomarkers or Target Proteins of, of uh, Biological or Clinical Interest. So the content for today's discussion will be introduction and we'll start mainly with the comparison of data dependent or DDA acquisition and data independent acquisition methods, experimental design and then data analysis for the projects that we're talking about during this section, guided DIA or inclusion of targeted MSMS to make specific measurements that are key to the biological question of interest, example data for a few of these measurements and discussion of future directions. So DDA, or data-dependent acquisition, is the traditional method for discovery proteomics, which relies on specific peptide identification. So at the top of this workflow, you have the total ion chromatogram, and you can see the signal at any given point for the MS1. The next part of this figure is the uh, example mass spectrum, where we see we're selecting a peptide at mass to charge 754, sequencing that peptide in tandem mass spectrometry, identifying it as a peptide sequence from creatine kinase M, and so the question is, you know, when we deal with this type of data, can we sample all of the observable peptide peaks? And, you know, it seems like some of the instruments that we have today are actually getting fast enough to do that type of work. Uh, but we also have options for data independent acquisition, which is the next slide here. Here again, the total ion current on the top left corner here with extracted ion chromatogram for one peptide of interest. And the question here is, using spectral library matching, can we just sample everything across the entire mass range that eludes with a certain amount of intensity? So we have an example here where we're showing the sampling with the dotted lines across the MS1 peak for extracted ion chromatogram of a particular peptide from EGFR. 
and then the library match of Y5 through Y8 fragment ions with high resolution and accurate mass so that we can identify that peptide peak based on its accurate mass of the parent, the accurate retention time through UPLC, and those four fragment ions which are also measured with accurate mass. So the question now is, you know, can, can we sample all of the peptides that elute during that process that have a certain amount of intensity? So this is an example of what the DIA instrument cycle looks like. On the y-axis here, we have mass to charge, and we're typically using from 450 up to maybe about 1,500 at 70,000 resolution, so very high resolution scan for the intact peptide precursors. And then we have a loop of 18 isolation windows from 450 going up to 1440. So you can see in the first part of the cycle here from 450 up to about 900, we're using five Thompson windows or delta M over Z of five. After that, uh, we're using 10 because there's less data out in the, that higher mass to charge region, less fewer peptides. And each of these windows has an overlap of one. And these are acquired at 17,500 resolution as you don't need still that very high resolution for the fragments that you needed for the parents. So overall, the workflow includes generation of a spectral library. This could be from experimental data. In the case of the examples that I'm giving today, we've generated our own experimental spectral library using formal and fixed paraffin embedded tissue samples, but you could derive these from publicly available databases. Um, you know, for example, some of the CPTAC data sets would have really high content for colon tissue, for example, um, it would be another great place to develop a spectral library that would have both cancer-relevant proteins as well as tissue-relevant proteins. We have the DIA experimental design, which can be one-size-fits-all, or as we'll talk about a little bit in, in this seminar, tuning it and tailoring it to exactly me making the measurements that you want. Uh, have strategies for data acquisition and then data analysis with spectral library matching. And the nice thing about DIA workflow is rather than having a very specific set of peptides sampled with tandem mass spectrometry, you have a broad acquisition of your tandem mass spectra that's amenable to further queries. So as we develop, for example, a database of all the mutant peptides that might be relevant to cancer, you could come back and query the existing data sets to see if you're able to observe those peptides. Now, I think the important caveat is that you'd want to make sure you are identifying the proteins with other peptides rather than just relying on the identification of a mutant peptide. But the, the nice thought on this is that with a DIA sample analysis, you'd be able to come back to it with new ideas, and it would be a little bit more um, fruitful in terms of developing additional use of the data. So there are a number of applications that have been out, uh, particularly starting with high-resolution accurate mass quantification. There are a number of pep, uh, papers from different groups, but Bruno Domon's group has been very active in this area. Um, there have been a number of developments for spectral libraries and targeted analysis. This is initially stuff that was developed with the SWATH techniques on quadrupole time-of-flight instruments, but now is available on QExactive or hybrid quadrupole ion trap type of instruments. And there's been a lot of movement to try and use this for very small amounts of sample. This example is clinical biopsies in a research-grade format. So the questions that I have about DIA is, you know, what is the tolerable level of complexity that you can have in your sample? You know, how many precursors can actually be detected in the MSMS and matched to the fragments using the spectral library approaches? What's the limit of confident identification? What level of sensitivity can be achieved for the low-level proteins, you know, the signaling hubs, for example, in cancer that you're really interested in observing? And what's accessible and what is missing? So, you know, in, in my mind, we're still starting to work on these, and we have uh, very much a research in progress presentation for today. Um, but, you know, I think DIA becomes an optimal choice for a limited amount of biological sample. And to be a little bit more specific, I mean a limited amount of biological sample would be too little to do fractionation strategies, try and increase the depth of the proteome, where you wouldn't be able to enrich that much and you wouldn't see that much more by processing it in a different way. You just have single sample analysis and so this is something that you might want to use for biopsy specimens for a single slice of a tissue section or as we'll talk about in a little bit, the individual points on a tissue microarray which are about you know one millimeter 
diameter circles of tissue that have been placed together to answer research questions. We've been collaborating a lot both with Thermo, with Scott Peterman, and also with Optus Tech, with Amol Prakash. We've been doing software evaluation for the DIA workflows and for the mixture of DIA and targeted MS2. Uh, the important part to get across, there are a number of workflows you can see with the red arrows in the middle there, but the part that's most relevant to the talk here is that we have two values, which are score four and score three in terms of what Optus Tech returns in the uh, Pinnacle software. High is spectral library match with everything also included in the medium setting. The medium is accurate mass to charge measurement, accurate retention time, and matching the theoretical isotope distribution, meaning that you have a good, strong, quantifiable signal. So those two classes of peptides are the ones that we will look at for our detection and quantification. So if we look at one example of a DIA sampling scenario and the isotope ratios, I mean, what you'd like to have when you're doing data-dependent analysis, you'd always like to sample every single uh, peptide for tandem mass spectrometry at the peak, and it's kind of the same thing that you'd like to have for DIA, but unfortunately to get the amount of content that you want across that entire mass range with the window size that we've selected, you're not going to be able to get that large number of samples. So as instrument speed increases, I think the quality of this will get better and better, but you can see in this particular example, we've picked a low-intensity peak that gives you somewhat poor signal to noise. You can see that you're sampling it twice, once on the upward shift of the curve and again on the downward shift of the curve. But when we look at the um, isotope ratio analysis on the right-hand side, the observed values or experimental values are in orange. The theoretical values are in blue. You can see good agreement. So we have MSMS -MS data matching on this, and we also have good agreement of the isotope ratios. So this is a, a score four or a high confidence peak. Um, it's from this peptide that's shown at the bottom right-hand corner. So overall, one of the things that we want to do as we're tuning this experiment is to look at the complexity of the window. And so one of the ways that you can do this is extracting out the total number of proteins that are represented by peptides within a particular window of mass to charge. Uh, so from 450 to 900, again, on the uh, x-axis here, we have a five-unit isolation window. From 900 to 1440, we have a 10-unit isolation window. And so that's why there's an artifactual break in the number of proteins around 900. The window extends uh, farther for each acquired tandem mass spectrum at that point. And we've also then taken anything with peptides above mass to charge 14,000. Uh, sorry, 1,440, and place that into one single category at the far right-hand side of the plot. And again, the high ID scores are spectral library matches. The medium ID scores are still quantifiable, but don't have the spectral library match present for every sample. As we want to tune these windows, we can ask a question about whether each of these windows has a certain number of unique proteins. Again, this is going to be dependent on the spectral library that you're working with, but you can see we have that plotted again across this range of DIA isolation windows. We don't have any unique proteins that are detected with peptides above mass to charge 1300. So one other way of saying that is that the higher mass to charge peptides don't represent any additional proteins that aren't represented by lower mass to charge peptides within this particular spectral library, which was from FFPE of uh, breast tumor tissue. Uh, we also had kind of an anomaly, one of the windows around 500 is actually empty of unique proteins, but it doesn't make sense to eliminate one of those windows that's really high content. But you can eliminate some of the other ones, perhaps shrinking the mass range down to about 1300 or even a little bit lower, and just you have to plan that around the loop count. So if we had a loop count this time of 18 windows acquired in each scan MSMS, then we need to eliminate 18 at a time. So to this point, we haven't actually tuned this down. We haven't really felt like it was necessary because we were still sampling reasonably well across our HPLC peaks and able to see as much as we want without cutting that part out. So the first application that we wanted to try was to recreate one of the things from Abersold's group where they analyzed individual tissue sections. So we digested a pretty large piece of this breast tumor tissue, injected about 0.1%, and we were able to get quite a lot of content, um, again, with looking at the high and medium matching peptides. 
And in this case, we're plotting the low peptides, which have accurate mass to charge and retention time, but they're poor signal, and so they're not really quantifiable. But you can see if we could enhance the signal a little bit, we probably would tune a lot of those peptides back into a more quantifiable range. But in any case, on the right-hand side at the top, we're showing the number of peptides that we're able to observe. So in the 90-minute gradient, we're able to see 9,000 or so of the high-confidence peptides, 5,000 medium-confidence peptides, and still able to recognize about 20,000 other peptide ion signals, which we don't have uh, strong confidence in terms of quantification or matching. And as we shrink the gradient length from 90 minutes down to 45 minutes, um, we see still almost 4,000 peptides in the high-confidence group and 2,600 in the medium confidence. So we don't have, um, you know, a huge reason to push to lower time. We'd like to reduce the amount of time as much as possible, particularly for looking at tissue microarrays where you might easily have one to 200 samples that you'd like to look at and compare uh, from that array. So, the, you know, the more time we can save, the better. But still, with the 90-minute run and 30-minute watching, about two hours per sample with 100 samples in the TMA, we'd have about 200 hours of required instrument time, which is really quite favorable for the amount of content that you're able to return with using the 90-minute gradient. Um, in terms of protein number at the bottom, uh, again, more than 3,000 proteins are observed using the 90-minute gradient with high-confidence peptide identifications and more, almost 1,200 more in the medium category. Uh, so taking those two together, more than 4,000 total proteins that you'd be able to observe in a 90-minute gradient experiment. That drops dramatically when you look at the 45 minutes, right? So only 2,000 that are in the high confidence assignments and 900 that are in the medium. So based on this kind of data, we really probably don't want to compress the gradient length very much. Um, we also haven't looked at gradients longer than 90 minutes, so we may have even additional content uh, matching against the spectral library if we used longer and longer gradients. But we wanted to develop something that would be able to go through these samples in a, a meaningful period of time and, and report back to results. So we're still trying to map what gets lost as we shorten the gradient and what type of content is missing from those experiments. But that's a, a good idea of the starting point and, and perhaps a, a reasonable place for us to start acquiring these data sets. So to further illustrate this point, we wanted to look at specific targets, and we chose 49 targets from our spectral library. We used immunohistochemistry um, from our pathology group, Tony Maglioco and Carolyn uh, Lorette de Mola provided a, us a list of the common targets that are performed for immunohistochemistry. Some of these are, are relevant to this type of tissue and some are not. We just wanted to look through and see whether we'd be able to see these types of targets because one of the ideas that we had was that this type of quantitative proteomics could query many of those IHC targets in a single sample rather than having to do sequential sections to do each one. We had some tissue quality control proteins, and we chose some proteins that were relevant to breast cancer research, EGFR or B2, those types of proteins. So when we look at the DIA experiment, we're able to detect 38 of those. Those are all listed in the black in the middle panel here. The ones that we weren't able to observe are shown in bold red, and the ones that could be detected in 90-minute gradient but not in the shorter gradient at 45 minutes, the peptides were lost for ANO6 and ANO10. And then on the far right-hand panel, you can see a heat map of the intensity, uh, basically showing the peptide count for each one of these proteins. So you can see even the ones that we are able to detect at 90 minutes, we have significantly higher number of peptides observed at 90 minutes than we do in the 75, 60, or 45-minute gradients. Again, that kind of reinforces the idea that we want to stick with that longer time. So we think this is good strategy for rapid analysis of small amounts of samples, and this could be, you know, precious cell lines or really complex model systems that are hard to do, develop a lot of material, or it could be precious clinical samples as well for addressing different types of research questions. So we're proposing a single LC-DIA MSMS analysis, and we think this is going to give us a lot of detail, probably more detail than the corresponding DDA type of experiment when fractionation isn't feasible for the samples. We're going to test this with TMA specimens.
So this is an example of TMA on the left-hand side here. This is a TMA of HER2 negative breast tumors that have been stained for the estrogen receptor. This is a TMA that was prepared at Moffitt under the supervision of Teresita Antonia, and it was one of many developed for analyzing research questions about breast cancer, particularly for enriching uh, different minority populations. And, you know, we've been able to show that we're able to excise these things with UV laser capture microdissection using the latest Arturus instrument. We can also do this from tissue as a simulation. We can take the tissue section, cut out a one millimeter circle, as you can see on the right here, and then take another image to show that we've completely eliminated all of the content that was on the membrane after the digestion procedure is over. So we've done a few examples of this type of experiment now. We've done different uh, kind of mimicking these TMA samples, and this was just one example here. We cut one millimeter circles using the UV laser capture microdissection, processed the samples and digested, injected about a third, and you can see we're pretty well consistently getting about 500 proteins in that high confidence uh, score region from Pinnacle. And so this was a little bit less content than I would have liked to see, but again, for an early stage research in progress, I think it was quite good uh, start. And there are many tissue proteomics experiments that have been successful in terms of returning a biological outcome uh, with this small number of proteins like this being detected. So our goal is to try and get the number of proteins identified up to about 1,500, and the easiest place to start with that is to inject the entire sample rather than just one-third. We also probably need to be a bit clever about how we're processing these samples and either do this in minimum volumes or prepare them perhaps even in the auto-sampler vials that are uh, going to be used for the injection so we can concentrate as much as possible and transfer the entire sample through to the mass spec. So one of the questions that we had, you know, we, DIA is very nice, but again, kind of going back to that question that we're still in the process of answering, what's the content that you're able to see and what's the content that gets lost? So this breast cancer tumor that we're working with is a triple negative, and so we don't expect high expression of the HER2 or ERBB2 protein. And so this made a, a useful background for us to try and measure that as a specific targeted MS2 type of experiment. And so what we've done here is we've supplemented our DIA to try and quantify that particular protein. So, you know, from a cancer biology standpoint, you may have certain hubs of signaling that you want to study. From a clinical standpoint, if you're asking a research question, trying to relate the proteome to a specific clinical biomarker, you definitely want to be able to measure that to get an anchor for your study so that you can look at all of the different questions that you have from the research side in the context of being able to measure that clinical biomarker that's so critically important. So what we're doing is we're adding stabilized tip labeled standard peptides. What we want to be able to do is acquire the data within a single DIA window and then answer the question about whether we need to redesign our DIA windows for targeted quantification or insert a targeted MS, MS into the DIA strategy. So this is just one example with the HER2 peptide targeted MSMS, -MS. the endogenous peptide at 483 mass to charge, the stabilized tip labeled standard is at 486. Our DIA window uh, typically in that range has been five. In this case, we did targeted MSMS. -MS. Using a little bit wider window, we wanted to capture all of the isotopes. So you can see in the blue box here, we selected a seven Thompson window for our targeted MS2, but we can certainly shrink that. I mean, the D using the same size window as the DIA at five would give you the first three isotopes of both the endogenous and the stabilized tip labeled standard, which should be more than sufficient for the isotope ratio calculations and also effective quantification. You could even drop it down to a window of four and capture the first two isotopes of each, and this would actually get you fairly close to what we use for our, our DDA window, which is two units um, of mass to charge. So, you know, the, you could tune this more and more finely and try and get very specific information to the exclusion of other peaks in that tandem mass spectrum. But to this point, we haven't needed to do that. So this is an example of how we set up the cycle with one uh, targeted quantification experiment. The reason we've had to do this is that there's one inclusion list for this whole 
uh, experiment. If we had separate inclusion lists for the DIA and for targeted MS2 where you could set very specific times, we could avoid this. So please lobby Thermo for that capability. Otherwise, you know, you could use segments and make a very, very complex program, but this was just something that we wanted to try very quickly to insert single targeted MS2 into every cycle. So again, mass to charge on your y-axis, the time on the bottom here, you can see the time it takes to do the high resolution scan for the peptide measurement, the DIA windows, then one targeted MS2 for that um, isolation window that we were talking about for measuring the peptide from HER2, and that's just implanted into every cycle. So you can probably do about two or three of these targeted MS2s in every single cycle, and if you were very clever and can program it out very complexly, you could do some, you know, set these so that you do one from, say, 25 to 30 minutes, another one from 30 to 35 minutes, and just program it such that you're always going to get the ones that you want as long as your HPLC is uh, stable enough. But just to do one example here, we've inserted this single uh, window at 485.5. Uh, if we find that we can do effective quantification, capturing these in the same tandem mass spectrum with a single spectrum, what we would probably do is just tune all of our DIA windows to make sure that they were centered to capture the endogenous and the stabilized to labeled standard. But you know, for this point and for the data that we already have, we think adding the targeted MS2 is a better approach. So this is just one example of DIA data for the standard peptide here, and the standard peptide sequence is at top right, ELV, SEF, SR, and we're using a stabilized tip labeled valine. And so you can see the MS1 extracted ion signals on the top plot, the DIA sampling at 488.5 with a 5 Thompson window in the second plot, and then the match of the data of the Y ions from Y1 all the way up to Y7 at the bottom spectrum. And this is just for inserting the stabilized tip labeled standard into the digest of the tissue and analyzing that. Then the next one shows the data independent acquisition and the targeted MS2 sampling for the standard peptide. So again, the MS1 extracted ion signal is in the first plot on top here. The next one shows the sampling for the targeted MS2. So again, about seven points across that peak, so you could expect pretty good quantification. And in this case, a very uh, poor sampling in terms of the DIA. We got something at the very beginning of the peak and at the very end of the peak, but not a good uh, point. I'll just go back to the previous slide. The previous slide, we sampled very near the peak with the DIA, so that was quite optimal for answering the question. But again, the reason to insert the targeted MS2 is to avoid the situation that we have in this particular experiment where you sample very, very early and very late in the peptide elution profile, but nothing in the middle. And then here we can see at the bottom, we have targeted MSMS data with the seven Thompson window. We're able to capture both peptides in this window and make multiple measurements using the different fragment ions. In this case, the difference uh, between the stabilized to labeled standard and the endogenous is mainly going to be reflected in the Y6. Y7 is kind of low intensity, so we didn't quantify there. But because we stabilized to labeled that valine that's contained in the Y6, that's the fragment ion that we're going to focus on. So when we look at the MS1 measurement with DIA, you have the identification from the library matches, but you have to quantify from the MS1 data. The endogenous peptide actually has a neighboring interference so you don't get baseline resolution, and that's going to affect the measurement quite a lot. So targeted MS2 is, or the, using the DIA to quantify has really high value in this particular case. You know, otherwise, we'd have to extend the gradient, try and pull those peaks apart from each other, and we're already using at 90 minutes a fairly long gradient for this type of experiment. So this is an example of the targeted MS2 data. You can see the two Y6 peaks here. In the inset, we've zoomed in a little bit and showed those two, the endogenous and stabilized tip labeled standard peaks. So we are able to obtain that data from the targeted MS2. If we compare the different quantification methods, again, at the top, we show the extracted ion chromatogram from the MS1, from the peptide mass spectra. You can see that interference in the endogenous signal. But when we extract the Y6 from the targeted MS2 scans, we don't have that interference anymore very clean signal and much more quantifiable. So we had a number of questions as we were looking at these types of data. You know, one was what's the reproducibility and effectiveness of measuring the 
extract and ion chromatograms um, for the quantity of those peptides, and you can see there's quite a distribution from heavy to light ratio of 1.5 up to almost 2. When we look at the Y6 intensity, just the peak height by data independent analysis, we see even more variability. And when we integrate the area under the curve using the targeted MS2, we get very consistent measurement here, and all the values are about 1.65 or 1.7. As we look at the individual targeted MS2 values, you can see the source of that variability. And you can see very early in that acquisition, we have very low signal, we have lower heavy to light ratio, but after a time that kind of normalizes out. And you can see that as you average all of this, you do end up with the average value that's the integrated area under the curve at the left there. But a high degree of variability between the replicates for using any single spectrum. Uh, for the DIA measurement. So going back into these data sets and quantifying on a specific fragment ion has, has some strength, but it also has some high variability that can be associated with it. Perhaps if we had multiple transitions for this peptide, we might get a better quality data set, but the way this stabilized table labeled standard was designed in particular mainly for an MRM type of experiment, uh, we don't have that same number of fragments that we might usually like. However, we do get very good quality data from calibration curves. So this is just the example again, that same peptide, and inserting both the heavy and the light into the triple negative background. So we're injecting 1.25 femtomoles of the stabilized to labeled standard for each injection, and light was ranging from 40 atomoles up to 80 uh, femtomoles, and we're quantifying again by the area under the curve for that Y6 fragment pair, and our CV value actually was less than 5.5% across the whole range. And so you can see a very nice R-squared value and very predictable uh, response as we're measuring in this context. So overall, you know, we think DIA will be optimal for generating maximal content from small, number, small amounts of samples and in large numbers of samples. Uh, we can tune the windows to meet the needs of the experiment and targeted MS2 can be inserted into these types of experiments for improved quantification of known targets or biological focal points for the study. We need separate lists for DIA and targeted MS2 or extensive programming using the time segments to make this happen under the current uh, programming. So you know, I think that there's a lot of promise here and we'd like to continue developing this and, and continue using it for as many targeted experiments as we can, but this starts to look as a very nice combination of broad-scale discovery with very specific quantification of the targets of interest. And there's certainly other uh, sophisticated strategies that have been reported out in the literature that we definitely like to implement for this. For example, putting in stabilized to labeled standards and then triggering uh, on the detection of those would be something that would be very useful here as well. So our future plans, we're in the process of implementing the method for doing some small-scale TMAs. We've got some research-grade uh, lung cancer TMAs that have about 20 to 25 samples. And so our set of specimens that we want to collect for this is one section with a high-quality hematoxylin and eosin stain so we can get really good information about the histology and the content of each tissue splice that we have. We want to process all of the samples together from a second slide to develop a spectral library specific to that sample type. This is a strategy that may or may not be necessary as we have large amounts of discovery data available and if we're able to integrate different discovery data sets into a very large spectral library, we probably won't have need to continue this type of experiment. But in the case of dealing with things like formal and fixed paraffin embedded tissue, I think it's important to know what content should be expected from those type of samples. And so for the moment, there's really high value in generating a spectral library using fractionation and using larger amount of sample. Um, the sections after that, three and four, for example, we would process all the samples individually and then make a replicate measurement and a biological replicate rather than a technical replicate as we expect to inject the entire sample for mass spectrometry analysis. And so what we're also working on in parallel is developing methods for the data analysis and a lot of the initial work is going to be in generating heat map displays for each protein that could be compared against immunohistochemistry. So you could look at the depth of the staining and also look at the score that you have from the signal in the mass spec. Uh, 
There was a very large number of people at Moffitt and also Thermo and Optus that contributed to this. And we've been supported by uh, people in my lab, three other research groups, the Gillies, Antonia, and Malioko research groups, and three of the core facilities, proteomics, analytic microscopy, and the tissue core at Moffitt. We've been supported by the National Cancer Institute, both through a Cancer Center Support Grant and an R21, as well as the U.S. Army Department of Defense, which has supported a National Functional Genomics Center at Moffitt. And at that point, I'd like to stop and be happy to take any questions. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Kuhlman. That was an excellent presentation. So let's go ahead to the Q&A segment. So if you haven't yet submitted a question, now is the time to do so by clicking on the Ask a Question box at the bottom of your screen. So let's see what questions have come in so far. Okay, first one is what is the limit for the DIA method? So we're still, I think, trying to figure this out, but obviously the most abundant proteins and the highest signal peptides from each protein are the best represented, and uh, you know we're trying to figure out where that line can actually be drawn by matching uh, some of our samples with DIA analysis with a an MRM based approach to quantify the levels of the proteins that we observe. All right. Uh, next question coming in. Um, it's kind of a two part. It says, really, can you just define what is a DIA window and what decides the length of a DIA window? Sure, absolutely. So every time you do an MSMS experiment in a mass spectrometer, you set a particular window around the, in the data dependent acquisition method, around the precursor that you're trying to select. And generally with these hybrid ion trap type of instruments, we would use about two mass to charge. So if you wanted to look at a peptide that you observe at 500, uh, at mass to charge 500, you'd select from say 499 to 501, or you might want to have it offset slightly from 499.5 to 501.5 to capture more of the isotopes. But um, so that's that's the definition of the window, and then. When you go into a data independent analysis strategy, you have to set some area of space that you're going to sample from the intact peptides. And that has to be based at least in part on the complexity that you expect for that region. So when you have lower mass to charge value, we tend to see a lot more peptides. And so we use a narrow window uh, there, five usually, or seven. So if you wanted to look at things that were around 500, you would select from, say, 500 to 505. The next window would be 504 to 509, and so on. So you have a, a small overlap between the different windows. You have to balance the number of windows that you want to observe and the, the amount of detail that you capture that way with the ability to sample your peaks in your chromatography. So we'd really like to have at least one sampling across the chromatography peak, which in our system is generally estimated at about 20 seconds. So we need to be able to go through the entire cycle of DIA windows across the whole mass range within that 20 second time period. And we'd really kind of getting to the point now where we'd like to have, if it's possible, two samplings across that entire window. So we might get you know, about halfway up the peak on the front and the back where you have a better chance to get something toward the apex. And going back to that slide where we looked at the individual samplings uh, from the, even from the targeted MS2, that kind of gives us a guideline of how well we'd like to be able to sample the peaks. And when we have our DIA strategy, we kind of randomly um, acquire in the area that we want, which would be at the apex of the peak. And sometimes we randomly acquire either too early or too late, and so we missed that. So we're trying to balance our need to get targeted MSMS data with the ability to get good sampling across every peak that we have. We think that's also a good way to convert the lower confidence measurements, whether they be accurate mass and time without the MSMS support, or even slightly lower than that, you have accurate mass and time, but poor isotope uh, resolution and a very uh, poor signal for the quantification. So we're, we're trying to work on those different strategies and make sure that we get as much content as we can and to push all of it toward the higher quality measurements. All right. Uh, next question is about how many micrograms do you inject per sample? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, I mean, we expect from the whole tissue section that we had 
maybe 25 micrograms total protein, so we're probably injecting between 250 and 400 nanograms for each sample that we put in. Um, you know, one of the things that we're still trying to understand is, especially for the smaller samples, is trying to determine a good way to measure the digestion efficiency there and see the total recovery at the peptide level uh, rather than trying to do protein assay from a larger sample and then carry that um, estimate through to the, the end. All right, next question is how many tandem, targeted tandem mass, mass spec acquisitions can be interleaved with the DIA approach? So I think at this point we would probably be comfortable going up to three. I mean, if we narrowed down our DIA window significantly or we had a, a higher frequency scanning instrument, then we probably would be comfortable to do more. Um, you know, what we'd really like to be able to do is have two inclusion lists, one for the DIA and then one for targeted MS2, where you could just say, I know for this particular peptide it elutes at 30 minutes, so I need a two-minute window, you know, say from 29 to 31 minutes, to monitor this with targeted MS2, and then you could stack a very large number of those measurements in, in parallel. But that's something that we're, um, you know, have to lobby for from the instrument company and get that capability. Uh, we're trying to do that a little bit with time segments, but it's quite a bit convoluted and would be much easier to do with two inclusion lists. All right, next question is, can DIA be applied to complex protein samples, and second part of the question, and also to study post-translational modifications? So first is complex samples and then post-translational. Yeah, so I, I, I would definitely uh, say yes, it can be applied to complex protein samples. I mean, the, the reason we're coming up with these hybrid strategies is to make sure that you're able to measure the things that you're really interested in. So when we have biologists that we work with here, or we have clinical faculty that have a research question, you know, they, they always come to us in the context of something else. So if, you know, particular signaling pathway is active for the basic scientist or the clinicians want to evaluate a lot of other uh, phenotypic information in the context of, you know, say a HER2 positive or HER2 negative breast tumors, then you always want to have that specific information that you obtain, and that's the reason for the hybrid acquisition. Um, we have used this technique also to study post-translational modifications. We have actually um, activity-based protein profiling data sets using this, so that's not really post-translational modification, but it is chemically modified uh, peptides. And you know, the, the, the nice thing about that is we're trying to enrich specific types of peptides, and so that's why I think it's actually a fairly good model for uh, post-translational modifications as well. If you enrich a specific class of peptides, I think this strategy allows you to see a little bit more uh, detail than a standard DDA experiment. Um, we've used this in the context of both cell lines and uh, tissue samples to look for kinases in the ABPP data, and so those are lower abundance than a lot of the other ATP utilizing enzymes that can be tagged by this strategy. And so we've developed an MRM-based approach for it, and we've also used this DIA type of strategy. You know, they tend to be low enough in the background that you don't observe them necessarily in a DDA experiment, uh, but with this we are filling in a significantly larger number of those measurements than we do with, with DDA uh, by applying the DIA strategy. So I think you can apply it to any, any type of uh, concept that you want. I mean, the main focus that we have is to try and simplify some of these measurements and make sure that you get the quality of measurement and the depth of measurement that you want within one single LC-MS-MS analysis, and that's where we think it helps the most. All right, next up is how do you measure the protein content from a TMA sample? Yeah, so this is a very big challenge. I mean, to this point, we haven't uh, we haven't done that. We've just digested everything, try and load it straight over. And one of the things that we're working on is using an algorithm like uh, Genie to evaluate the amount of tissue cellularity and say, you know, stromal content that's there in that slide, and then link that to the amounts of intracellular proteins that we see or extracellular proteins that we see, as an example. Um, I did recently, as I will probably sound like a horrible corporate shill again, but we did recently talk to somebody at Thermo who developed a method for quantifying the amount of digested peptide that you had in very small samples. So that's a product that's maybe released already, I'm not sure. Uh, we haven't used it, but that's one of the things that we'd like 
like to try. I mean, the, the issue that we have with this type of sample is that there's just not going to be enough to do a protein assay. And I think even if we had an, a duplicate sample that we tried to solubilize as aggressively as possible with detergent, we probably still wouldn't have enough uh, to do a parallel protein assay using the the standard methods that are applied to larger samples. So that's something that we're still working on and whether we can match it by really doing good histological evaluation of the tissue uh, or by doing a chemical readout is still a question that we have. All right, next question. Um, what is your data variability, meaning the total number of peptides, between the different TMA spots when using DIA? So. That uh, we had about 500 proteins, and I don't remember the number of peptides. I'm thinking it was probably around 2,000 peptides that matched to that. Okay. And we do see those very consistently across. I mean, that's one of the things that um, you know. Once you're counting here mainly on the MS1 quantification, with the exception of the targeted tandem mass spectra. Uh, so if you have the accurate mass and time of that peptide, you have pretty good confidence with many of these samples being you know, fairly consistent about the overall background and having kind of minor biological changes, um, you feel pretty confident in assigning those peptides when they have those, uh, uh, that, that particular uh, set of parameters. And we've done that with a number of different strategies, and, and we don't feel like we have to have identification every single time. All right, next question. Um, is peptide enrichment necessary for DIA if the modified peptides are low abundance and in a complex proteomics sample? So I would say definitely yes. I mean, if you're interested in modified peptides, the, the success that we have historically here at Moffitt with the different uh, collaborations that have used proteomics has always been in enriching modification. So if people are interested in studying kinase signaling, then we definitely want to enrich the phosphopeptides. If people are interested in studying ubiquitination processes for proteasome inhibitors, for example, or for differential degradation studies, then you want to enrich the ubiquitinated sequences. And so we always would recommend people focus the power of the mass spec on exactly what they want to study. Okay, next up we've got some Got a, a good list of great questions here. Next is, how many peptides can be detected per tandem mass spec, in, mass spec in DIA, and what's the limit of acceptable complexity? Yeah, so we're, we're still doing the counting on that, unfortunately. I was really hoping to get an answer by now, but we, we have seen multiple um, things that identified in each tandem mass spectrum, so there definitely is good value to doing it that way, and it does indicate that you get better content than from a DDA. But to get an average, you know, I think we want a, a rolling average per mass window over time just so we can evaluate how complex the uh, the peptides are coming off the gradient from the HPLC at every given time. And we'll get a much better idea of what the value is in particular parts of the experiment. All right. Next up is uh, what mass spec specificities should be met to be able to do DIA? So, I mean, in, in that case, you just have to decide, I think, the content that you want. I mean, in general, we feel like for, from our perspective, you have to have really high resolution, accurate mass measurement of the intact peptides. That helps you map them across the different experiments. So that's either a time of flight type of instrument or an orbital ion trap type of instrument. Um, we've done a few of these types of experiments on an older linear ion trap instrument, and then you have to really rely more on having high-quality MSMS matches, so your content drops significantly. You're not able to take the strength of identifications across the whole data set necessarily. You'd have to rely on having tandem mass spectra in every single example. Okay, next up is why do you have confidence in spectral library matching as compared with data-dependent analysis? Yeah, so I think that's probably the hot button issue for a lot of people. Um, you know, generally we feel that if we have a good match there, you know, you have, say, really accurate mass measure down to the PPM level for the intact peptide, you have that same accuracy for your fragments, you know, you're actually getting much higher quality and sometimes even higher content than people would get for a multiple reaction monitoring experiment. So we just have very, very good uh, confidence in the assignment, and 
you know, even being able to do some limited database searches where you put in just the limited amount of information that you're going to use for your spectral library match to verify your peptide, you'll still get exactly that same assignment. So having really accurate intact peptide mass and three to four fragments in most cases will give you almost unequivocally the peptide match that you've made from the spectral library. Okay, we have time for a few more here. Uh, next question is, um, is there a maximum acquisition time in a DIA experiment? So I would say no. I mean, that's the maximum time of any LCMS experiment is going to be determined by the limit of the chromatography that you're selected. So your ability to apply a really long, flat gradient to the particular column set that you're using. In our case, it's really a practical limit. I mean, we have an instrument here that's shared by a number of research groups, and there's certain amounts of time that we would like to be able to complete these studies. You know, if you have, say, 100 specimens in tissue microarray, or you have somebody that's doing a number of different drug treatments, dose escalation studies, time course experiments, they want to be able to follow all of that information and generate the data in a reasonable period of time. And a reasonable period of time for us would be somewhere between two and four weeks. Then we're generally looking at 90-minute gradients and two-hour total run times. Okay, next up. Um, can you analyze interprotein cross-linking by DIA? I would think that you would be able to, but I don't know. We, we've obviously not tried that. Um, you know, one of the, the issues that you might have is one of the major challenges in dealing with branched peptides or cross-linked peptides is the difficulty in interpreting the tandem mass spectra. Um, DIA as a secondary strategy would allow you to go through a larger number of samples to look for peptides that you've already identified in the spectral library. But I think for the cross-linking type of experiments, that may be the major challenge is identifying all of those cross-linked peptides and getting them into the spectral library so that you could do the matching. Um, if it was just simply to cross-link peptides to, a, or cross-link, excuse me, proteins to a particular bait so that you could pull that out and you could identify peptides other than the ones that were cross-linked together, I think it would be a very suitable strategy. You'd be able to make spectral library from a full pull-downs and then apply that to a large number of samples. Okay, I think we just have a couple more here we can take in our time. Uh, next is, how does a shorter gradient affect the detection of total protein number across a specific pathway? Yeah, so we've we've started looking at that, and you, know, you lose the ability to detect peptides, individual peptides, much more rapidly than you lose the ability to detect proteins. So I think even the short gradients are going to be effective in measuring some of the major metabolic pathways. You know, in cancer, people are interested in glycolysis and the Farberg effect, and so some of those high abundance pathways, while you lose peptides very rapidly, you don't lose uh, proteins that rapidly. You know, for the lower end. Uh, if you don't have a longer gradient, you don't have good separation and, you know, kind of minimize complexity in your tandem mass spectra, it becomes harder and harder to match some of those lower abundance signals to the tandem mass spectra and get the confident identification. So those tend to drop out much more quickly. All right. Well, we are just about out of time, and so we're going to conclude the question and answer session. Uh, I'd like to tell you that today's webinar has been recorded and will be available for viewing in the next few days. We will send you an email with details on how to access the recorded webinar along with a PDF of the slides and instructions on how to personalize and print a certificate of attendance. So on behalf of today's speaker, Dr. John Kuman, and from me, Gwen Taylor, and our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific, we sincerely appreciate your attending today's webinar and hope you learned some valuable information. This concludes today's webinar, and we look forward to your attendance at future events from Current Protocols.